The Diving Bell and the Butterfly is the autobiography of Jean-Dominique Bobby. In 1995, Jean-Dominique was the editor-in-chief of the French fashion magazine Elle. He suffered a stroke that destroyed his brainstem. He lost almost all his physical capability, but remained mentally active. He had acquired what we know of as locked-in syndrome. Incredibly, Bobby wrote his book after he had become locked in. The only muscle he could move was his left eye, so he wrote the entire book by winking. The way they did it is they set up the letters of the French alphabet in frequency order, pointed to each one, and when they came across the letter that he wanted, he would wink. It took 10 months, four hours a day, to complete the book. Each word took two minutes to write. That is the nature of being locked in. Your intelligence, my intelligence, is also locked in. Claude Shannon is the father of information theory. He defined the fundamental unit of information as to be the amount of information that transfers between us if I were to toss a coin, look at the result, and say, heads. That's one bit of information. He suggested that information should be additive. So if I toss the coin twice, heads, and then the second time, tails, you get two bits of information. He was also interested in the amount of information in the English language. And he determined that on average, each word in the English language has 12 bits of information, equivalent to 12 coin tosses. Now, if we think about Bobby, he was communicating at a rate of one word every two minutes. Now, if we assume the amount of information in the French language is the same as the English, which it certainly isn't to me, but to a, a French speaker it would be, um, then we can see that he was communicating at a rate of 12 bits every two minutes, so six bits per minute. That's his communication rate. So how does that compare to us? Well, the average TEDx speaker talks at about 160 words per minute, 320 times faster than Bobby. So that's about 2,000 bits per minute, 2,000 coin tosses. That's a lot. I don't think I could say that just straight out like that. So there's a lot of information in my words. We're doing quite well. But imagine how much more thought that Bobby was putting in to each of his words. That's what it means to be locked in. Now we have other intelligences around us. It's not just us. There are computers. And those computers also communicate with one another. Now when a computer is communicating with another computer, it does so at the rate of billions of bits per minute, orders of magnitude faster than us. It's in a totally different regime. Now, communication isn't the only aspect of being locked in. You have to have a number of thoughts. So it's not just how fast you're communicating, it's how fast you can think. So Bobby and I, we can assume we probably roughly think at the same rate. But where are our computers on that uh, scale? Well, you, you might be surprised to know that actually computers think slower than us. What am I saying? That doesn't seem to make sense because we know that a computer can calculate faster than us. And, and sure, it can if we're calculating consciously, but underlying our thoughts, there's millions, hundreds, billions of calculations going on in our neurons which generate our higher thoughts. How many? We don't know because we don't know the mapping of those calculations to our thoughts. But what we can estimate is how large a machine it would require for us to emulate a human mind. The machine we would need is actually here in Exeter. It's the fastest computer in the UK. It's the 11th fastest in the world. We just missed the top 10. It computes at 16 billion, billion calculations per second. And it's used to simulate the weather across the world every day. So in order to compute as, as fast as a human being, we need that 11th fastest computer. But in contrast, our ability to communicate is slower. This is what leads to our locked-in intelligence. The ratio of our ability to communicate versus our ability to compute. 
I call this the embodiment factor. And one way of thinking about it is to think of how long it would take to tell you what is in one second of computation. So if we were to take a computer and take what it does in one second of computation and allow it to try and communicate all that information, it turns out it would take, for a typical computer, not the Met Office one, a sort of slower one that we might own, around 20 minutes. So a little bit longer than a TED talk should be. However, if I were to stop and think for a second, and if I now was capable of accessing all my neurons and all the calculations they were doing and capable of starting to speak and tell you those, it would take us 15 billion years to get through them. That's longer than the age of the universe. I think most of you would have left. <laughs> Bobby, on the other hand, is five trillion years. Longer, sure, 320 times longer. But when you compare the computer with its 20 minutes and us with our 15 billion years, we're right there with Bobby. We're in the same place. That's what I mean when I say that you're locked in. One analogy I use to think about this is, uh, is, is cars. I was a mechanical engineer as an undergraduate. I loved cars. So I like to think of Formula One engines, very powerful engines. That's our intellect. That's the quality of what's going on in our head. That's the power that we have. But unfortunately, when we try and drive those cars, think not of the regular Formula One car. Think of a car with that engine. But when you look at the wheels in your mind, think of bicycle wheels. That's your ability to deploy that intellectual power onto the track. In contrast, our computers are less well-powered. They have less power in their engines, but they have well-matched tires. They're more like a go-kart. They can use all their power to deploy. So they're more efficient than us, but they're somehow less beautiful, less extraordinary. Who wouldn't want to watch people driving those extraordinary vehicles or attempting to? So where do we use that excess power if we can't deploy it on the track? Well, I'm trying to communicate with you now. Whether I'm doing so well or not is dependent on my choice of what words I use, the analogies I choose, the things I say, to try and understand my audience and say, if I say this thing, it will move their mind towards where my mind is. I can communicate state in that way. If I have a conversation with an individual, when I'm speaking to that individual, I have a mental model in my mind of what that individual thinks. And I choose my words that I send to that individual in order to try and take my thoughts and put it in their minds. They, of course, have the same image in their heads of who I am and what I think about them. So they then make a choice of what to say back because they don't understand. Or they look quizzically at me. They make some kind of response. When it works, this, this dance is beautiful, our ability to communicate ideas. But if we misdirect our words or we don't understand each other, what we get is a horrible crash. An argument follows. Computers are very different. Their intelligence is based on large amounts of data. They are not using all that compute to model us. They use more data than we can possibly imagine. And that's not a problem. That's fine, because that's complementary to what we do. We can't deal with the large data, but we work well with other humans. They deal well with large data, but don't work so well with other humans. However, when you interact with a computer, it's important to bear this in mind. It's important to remember that you are not interacting with another human. Our tendency to model what we communicate means that we tend to anthropomorphize everything. Embodiment, in fact, has explained why. At one level, we are capable of simulating our weather across the planet, but not capable of designing things that understand our moods. As humans, we empathize. Our cats, our dogs, our cars, we give them all human characteristics in an effort to communicate with them. Our computers are very different. Their computation is being based on very large amounts of data. The challenge is that our fears around AI are based on this anthropomorphization. We fear we are creating a better version of us, something with the same motivations as ourselves. 
but more powerful because it has these additional abilities. We are not. The real danger is a very different one. The real danger is that those computers do not anthropomorphize us. They work below our cognitive radar. They make decisions about us without understanding the human condition. That is the challenge. Some researchers advocate transhumanism. Who wouldn't want the ability to assimilate this communication power of the computer, that multi-billionaire power that is within the machine? But what if it is our limitations that define us? What if the thing that we value the most, our consciousness, is a side effect of our need to understand and be understood? Artificial intelligence is not the same as humans. The A in AI does not stand for anthropomorphic. It stands for artificial. Artificial in the way that a plastic plant is artificial. There are real dangers with AI, as there are with any new technology. But if we are to face those dangers head on as a society, we need to understand what we are dealing with. We are defined by our need to communicate. Our lives are defined by the things we create, whether it's music, dance, art, literature, poetry, even sport. The computer has no need of these. Your cat understands you better than your computer understands you. Your cat understands me better than your computer understands me, and it hasn't even met me. When you think of AI, think of the plastic plant. A plastic plant does some of the things a real plant does. It's also very convenient. It doesn't need watering. It doesn't need light. It won't outgrow the place you put it. It fulfills some of the characteristics of a real plant. But it is not a real plant. Our fears around AI are based around a conflation of who we are and what we create. We are defined by our limitations, just as Bobby was defined by his. Or maybe limitations is the wrong word. Because as Bobby says, we can always escape within ourselves. And these are his words. My cocoon becomes less oppressive, and my mind takes flight like a butterfly. There is so much to do. You can wander off in space or in time, set out for Tierra del Fuego or for King Midas' court. You can visit the woman you love, slide down beside her and stroke her still sleeping face. You can build castles in Spain, steal the golden fleece, discover Atlantis, realize your childhood dreams and adult ambitions. Enough rambling. My main task now is to compose the first of these bedridden travel notes so that I shall be ready when my publisher's emissary, emissary rise, arrives to take my dictation, letter by letter. In my head, I turn over every sentence ten times, delete a word, add an adjective, and learn my text by heart, paragraph by paragraph. This book, this fight, can never bud from an artificial plant. <laughs>